goes on a little too long because it goes on for another 15 seconds all right welcome to line my line bible studies you know what i think i'm gonna do well i'm just gonna get used to it these headphones are new and uh they f- everything sounds a little weird to me but i can hear fine so that's good all right continuing in proverbs we're gonna start reading in chapter 15 a soft answer turneth away wrath but grievous words stir up anger a tongue of the wise useth the knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. One moment. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he that loveth him, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more the hearts of the children of men. A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. A merry heart maketh cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of heart the spirit is broken. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. The way of the slothful man is in hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. One moment. Trying to confirm my audio is okay. All right, everything is fine. Verse 20. This sounds different. A wise son maketh a glad father, 
but a foolish man despiseth his mother. Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom, but a man of understanding walketh uprightly. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors they are established. A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season. How good is it? How good is it? The way of life is above the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked poureth out evil things. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. The light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart, and a good report maketh the bones fat. The ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Oh, you know, I, there's a lot of great ones here. I can't wait to get to the later part. It's such a, um, you know, obviously we can't cover it all in one sitting, or we could, but that would be an injustice. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. There's a similar one that comes later on. And as I was reading it, I was thinking about that repetition. The thing about wisdom is a lot of times things do need to be repeated, and they need to be turned over and turned around. That's why a lot of these proverbs, they're similar, but there's slight differences. You think, well, why do, why, you know, couldn't it all be codified? Yeah, I suppose you could, or could you? I don't know. I think you could break it down even further is what, is what it is. <clears throat> there's a lot of nuance to how you deal with different situations. A soft answer turneth away wrath. You know, turning down the volume helps allay a, a situation. You know, um, if you turn up the volume, and especially not just the volume, but the nature of the words, grievous words. I wonder what the word grievous is here, but certainly we can use our imaginations to think of all kinds of grievous things that people say. The funny thing is this word is actually idle, which is a good, interesting choice, I think. Hold on, let me bring up the thing. I, I, as soon as I saw that, I, the quick definition when I hovered over it is when you use Bible Hub if you're actually on a PC. I don't know if it works this way on the phone, though I do have a phone version of this. Um, you hover and it says, at Seb, idle. I'm like, idle? Oh, idle, of course. That makes a lot of sense. A hurt, pain, or toil. Why did it say idle, though? Does it have a meaning of an idol anywhere in here? Hmm, a vessel despised, figurative of Kanaya, Jeconiah, the despised king, from Atsab, an earthen vessel, usually painful, toil, also a pang, whether about grievous. So it gets tri translated idle at some point, but I suppose as something grievous. Idle would have been kind of interesting. It comes from a root that means an earthen vessel, because I thought idle in terms of like a straw man, like. When someone says something about you that isn't true, you know, you start saying stuff to get under someone's skin, you know, or people do this, you know, in what could be considered like sort of dirty fighting, you know, uh, verbally, where they start mischaracterizing maybe what you think, mischaracterizing, you know, and it can be frustrating people, you think this, and it's like, well, that's not what I think, and they start arguing against what you don't think or something like that. When they said idle, I thought of that immediately, like a like where someone straw mans you. But um, it doesn't mean that precisely. But all those kind of things, when you grieve someone with your words, when you cause pain to someone who
who's already, you know, let's say, you know, they're angry. And then, you know, you, you stoke the fire. And it's not wise, obviously. A soft answer. What is soft? Uh, I'm going to look at the quick definition real quick without bringing it up. Soft. Tender, delicate, soft is the quick definition. Okay. I'm gonna, an answer response. Yeah. Being gentle, restrained, not just in your tone, but in your use of words. Because you can say things as sweetly as you like. If they're nasty at the core, then they're nasty. You know, I, I, I don't like people who do. There are people who, oh, and they, 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 they think that because they're like talking softly, the fact that their, their mouth is a gutter of, of uh, malicious uh, intent, you know, of, of the things that come out of it. Not necessarily of like foul language. I mean, just like of foul ideas of being a foul person. Yeah, that'll start banger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. There's a couple like this that kind of, I feel like, go together, which was also like um, the... Well, whatever. Well, hopefully we'll get to the other one. But also, but the idea that... <clears throat> There's a correct way to use knowledge. Oh, it talks about studying at some point. You know, studies to answer. It, well, I guess we should save that for when we get there. But there's, you know, like you can study but still never come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, uh, always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't study. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like a fool doesn't study. But we don't want to be ever studying but never able to come to conclusions, of course. Um some things don't necessarily come to a conclusion, you know, because there are questions which God has not revealed the answer. This is acknowledged, in the, you know, throughout Scripture and even in the New Testament and the way, you know, Paul talks about we see through a glass darkly, but then you know, we, we don't know what's going to be, especially. It's hard for our mind to conceive, apparently. But we know a lot of things about it everlasting life but um there's a correct way to use knowledge and there's a wrong way to use knowledge right and it and it <laughs> and they, it's a form of foolishness to misuse what you know or even i would say you know oft times because people are credentialed we presume them to have knowledge even if their mouths are pouring out foolishness, even if they lie and, and speak out of both sides of their mouths consistently. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. It's a bit of wisdom to know. You know God sees all. He sees the good, he sees the bad. So that, that's a good proverb of wisdom. You know, to, I mean, literally, like that's an axiomatic verse you could stick literally at verse one of this book. Not that you literally would, but because there is like the you know a little introduction. But I mean, you could put it almost anywhere because it and, it, and it's something that maybe should be said fifteen ways, fifteen different times. You know, God sees all. That is the. Why should I fear God? Because God sees all. He beholds the evil and the good. And he intent and he he's not like it's it's <laughs> because he lets us do all the way to the end and then see people die and think that okay, it's safe. We can just, you know, there's no it's all it just comes to an end and then that's it. And they think, well, that's <laughs> okay, well then we'll do what we will. Well, the wise understand. The eyes of the Lord are watching. You know, we don't get away with anything. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. I'm guessing wholesome is healthy again, like last time. Uh, let's see. Let's see if it's anything different. Yeah, there was Mar Pay Healing Cure. We we discussed that word recently, so I'm not going to bring it up. The tongue 
that brings forth words that are healing, life-giving, edifying. Things that build us up, that help us serve the Lord, that help us, uh, you know, and also that profit you in other ways, of course. It, it, you know, axiomatically, someone who has good advice is going to be promoting life. I mean, because life on earth can be a difficult thing. And so, yeah, wisdom, health, you know, good words, words that promote health. You know, I, I definitely do believe in promoting health, you know, because when I think about tribulation and stuff like that, because I believe there is a tribulation to come. And I, while there's, um, while it is not targeting us in any way, shape, or form as Christians, meaning from the, from the Lord, it's not God's wrath. But the world, but we, we have a job to do here, and I want to be able to, uh, you know, rise to the challenge, right? You know, it's, it's, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to do that if I don't keep myself in reasonable shape, you know. And um, I want to rise to the challenge. So, health in the body, yeah, bodily exercise profits a little while, but remember, Paul lived in a day when people walked everywhere, and obesity was like, only kings were fat, or people who were so rich they could be carried around or something, I don't know, because there was no cars, no, um, you know, <laughs> no processed food, uh, <clears throat> a lot of things, so they, they tended not, I mean, some people got fat, surely, but, um, Again, not usually, even then, I bet they were in better shape than us because they were, if they got fat from overeating, they were just eating a lot because they still had to mostly walk, like I said, or find some people to carry them, I guess, I don't know. The, the, I mean, I, I suppose you could ask an archaeologist if they've examined skeletons for signs of obesity. Because they probably could detect it to anyone who'd been obese for a long period in their life and died, uh, you know, whatever, after, at some point, I guess they could probably tell. I don't know. I don't know if that's possible. I mean, I, I definitely think it, lo it does long-term damage to your joints and if it's possible, you know, I don't know. I don't know enough about the science to be able to say. But a fool despiseth his father. Oh, wait, perverseness therein is a breach in spirit. And, you know, that doesn't necessarily, well, in the spirit of what? In, you know, I'm going to look at, I'm assuming that's the normal word for spirit, which is ruach. And because I'm trying to think, like, what is it? What is the, in Proverbs, what is Solomon? Like, this is an unusual thing to, like, there haven't been many spirit um, mentions. <clears throat> in fact, I'm going to look at that real quick. And we will go there because what I'm interested in is more than just the definition because I know it's going to be something I'm familiar with. Yeah, Ruach, spirit, right? Oh, there's going to be too many occurrences. I wanted to look actually in, well, I can look them all up. Let's see. I was curious how many in Proverbs have we had? And here when I click on that, I get to look at every occurrence of the word Ruach in the entire Old Testament. I get down to Proverbs. Oops, too far. It does get mentioned a lot. Not a whole lot before. I mean, yeah. not, not a whole lot before. What is it? I will pour out my spirit on you. Well, not, yeah. Of faithful spirit. These are more understandable to me. Shall inherit the wind. It's also translated wind. I didn't note that one. Um, well, let me see. In this case, would that be a, a breach in the wind? No. <laughs> Well, it's kind of an interesting thought. The heart of the spirit is broken. See, that makes sense to me. A breach in the spirit is kind of hard for me to nail down, right? It's like the idea, the concept of poor in spirit that I, you know, for so long um, meditated on. Now, I haven't noted it because now here weighs the motives, the spirits. Now, see the spirit there as a motive. And the reason I'm using this, where is this? Uh, 16, you see that? Why is it not? Oh, it's not down there yet. Okay, I see. I have my, mine's too long. I want to make sure I know you're on the screen with me. Okay, see here it says, it uses the spirit as like wind and, and also these other things. 
And obviously, contextually, it makes sense. Clouds and wind. And that's how you have to judge it. So the question is, in what sense is spirit being used in, in this passage? Right? I like, in Proverbs 16, too, it says, The Lord weighs the motives. The Lord weigheth the spirits, is what the King James says. But the New American Standard says motives. And, and spirit as motive force in a person. You know what I mean? Because that is... That is a good description of what uh, what your spirit is. It is the motive force. It is you know when you're in high you know um, maybe that's not a definitional thing. I'm getting maybe excited about that. I kind of like that. That is a at least a partial description of what you know your spirit represents in you. Um, uh, it's the it it. It, it's the spirit that animates and brings us to life. It's what God breathed into us and that makes a man a living soul. Um, and so in this sense, when it talks about a breach in the spirit, I'm going to think of it as um, like a person, like where it talks about it also, a faithful spirit. You know, he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter, right? So that's the sense in which I'm thinking of spirit here. I, I don't know. I don't know why. Maybe I'm stumbling too hard at it. Like it's a, a big deal or a difficult thing. It's not that difficult. But um, on some level, a breach in the spirit just sounds to me such a an odd way to characterize something. But um, yeah, because because it, it is like obviously when your tongue is speaking lies, perversity, you know. The spirit that you are, that's coming out of your mouth is not connected to that which is in your brain in a sense. And also there's a breach like sort of in the contract of like when someone talks to you, the presumption that you're going to be honest with them. Obviously. A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. You know, this is, we've, <laughs> we've talked about instruction as a father i say to other fathers you know careful as you you know yes you need to use correction sometimes that involves the rod for serious and for serious things you know lying stealing cheating whatever you think is really bad you know certain things require uh definitely the rod in in my ass that's why i did it but that doesn't mean uh, everything does for sure, you know, and I try to be very, uh, you know, do not pro, you know, it says fathers provoke not your children to wrath and by overly, by, um, what is it? Over, being an over, you know, by being overbearing is one way you can definitely make people not like you. You have to be, cause you have to be in authority. You have to be in control. You have to be all these things, but at the same time, you you don't want to become a tyrant. You want to become like the, basically the antichrist of your home. You know, I mean, everyone must worship me. You know, and do what I say. You know that that's not how authority is supposed to work. We're supposed to be like Christ. We lead. You know, and and Christ at times had very sharp words for his disciples. You know, and they and you think about the things that Peter. I mean, Peter got some very. Um, Negative experiences. I mean, I was just put, you know, when he denied Christ, that was um, hard on him. Not that Christ did anything to him, but it's like, point is, Christ led with love, you know, and we should lead also in that way, you know. Even if we often have sharp tongues, it's, it's, it's with a view of kindness. It's with a view to bettering everyone. And, and if they understand everything you're doing is for everybody to make everything better um, and to make everything work, because in a large house, you have to, everyone has to cooperate. If they can understand that, if you can make them understand that, they, you know, they would be fools to despise your instruction. What kind of, I'm, I'm thankful. I don't have any fools among my children. Not outright, <laughs> anyways, right? I've certainly when I actually reprove them, 
You know, if I, the thing is, sometimes you got to make it known when you're serious. You know, you got to learn to turn up the volume slightly. Volume is good sometimes, but like I said, the quality is m- far more important of what you're saying. The kind of words. Do you want to damage them or are you trying to build them up? You know, you got to think about it. Sometimes people need a bit of a, you know, cutting down to size. If it's true, sometimes there's a true critique that needs to be made. Um, and it's hard to hear for them. Don't be too harsh. If you haven't been too harsh in the past, you may, you'll have like the parental capital to do that, if you know what I mean. Like they used to talk about political capital, a parental capital, meaning there's goodwill between you and your child so that you can come down on them and say no, and they still feel bad about it and not resentful. Meaning they feel bad in a sense of like, oh, you know, I disappointed my, they want, they want to please you still. You know, I know what it's like. I, I remember when I, when I realized, when, it's funny because I realized there was, I didn't want to please my mother anymore. You know, there was a point. And that's not something I, to me, that's proud. It's just like, because nothing I could do would ever please because they weren't the right things. That's the thing. You know, a fool despiseth his father's instruction. I think I've said before, you know, my 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 dad was instructed by his dad in a lot of unrighteous things. <laughs> you know, and so you got to take that with of course wisdom. A fathers not all fathers raise their sons the same. You know, I said, my dad raised me the way he did because he was reacting. He was trying to just not, he was trying to do things different. He didn't know how. He didn't have, I mean, he knew kind of how, but not, he didn't have enough real understanding to know. You know, when you aren't raised right, it's hard to raise a family right. You know, but in his efforts, it put the seed into my head to try even harder. So... And, uh, and, you know, and, and perhaps, you know, and so I'm thankful on that level because, like, well, you know, they pointed me in the right direction, you know. In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. You know, and, and, and again, the revenues of the wicked is trouble. It, it's, it's metaphorical of a lot of other things. You know, I mean, like, just like riches, you know, it's like, hey, I got riches in heaven. You know, it's like there, there are all kinds of riches, you know, just like there's all kinds of, uh, well, there's riches, there's power, there's but there's also things like moral authority by being, you know, by doing right. I mean, of course, that's righteous. Righteousness, there is treasure in it. You know, people, you know, happy are they the hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they should be filled, Jesus said. You know, and of course, you know, Christ the righteous is the only righteous. There's none righteous, no, not one. We know that. But the point is, if it were such a thing, you know, I always have to reiterate that, you know, this is an absolute standard. And of course, in the house of Christ, there is much treasure. That is where the treasure is, in the house of the righteous one. You know, and of Christ the righteous is all the treasures you could hope for. But in doing right also, yes, there's practical treasure in it. Your integrity. You know, what, you, know you put on the breastplate of righteousness. What do you think? That's just a piece of plastic you put on your chest? No, you have to actually be righteous to have that blessed breastplate. The shield of faith is actually faith. It's not like some tin, tin uh, whatever. It's not even, it's not some steel reinforced whatever to sh- shield you from nonsense. You don't need that. All you need is your faith to shield you. All you need is, you know, and you don't technically need righteousness. Well, you have the righteousness of Christ, but it is a good thing to have. Not just the righteousness of Christ, because like, men aren't going to care so much about how much a fan of Jesus you are if you're a scoundrel. You know, it's just plain and simple as that. We can't just do as the wicked do and and, and think that that is, is, is acceptable as Christians. 
I, you know, I'm not saying you're going to hell. You're just not, hey, get in, get your, you know, like, I'm not throwing you out. I'm just kicking your rear end and get back in line. Move it, you know? That's all. You're in the house of Christ now, so it's like we have to, we have to behave. You know, we're going to a wedding. We got to put the right kind of garments on. This is what you signed up for. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it is. The revenues of the wicked is trouble. You know, I, the thing, the gain they get, even the gains they make, is a problem. So I say, the rich get rich, and they're still not satisfied. They they think about their money all the time, I and mean, just just on that level, it's just everything is is constantly focused on the on the world and maintaining that which they cannot keep, and building that which they cannot keep building. <clears throat> the lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. Yeah. <laughs> The the because when the, when the foolish use knowledge, it's it's useless. You know, be, like because because knowing facts about things does not is not the same as having the full picture. The complete story. And um, knowledge is often more than just like I said. It's like when I talk about how you discipline a child. Wisdom, yeah, he that spareth the rod hates his son. When it's, but, you, but it takes wisdom to understand that that also means, you know, when a rod is called for. You know, it, 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 that's why the Lord, well, that's why in the law there was, you know, the penalty, there was no uh, physical pun penalty punishment that exceeded uh, 40 lashes. Lest, you know, because it's dehumanizing. Lest your brother, lest your brother should seem vile to you. You start beating a man that that mercilessly. It does things, to, you know, because it's like I says, lest your brother seem vile to you. It said, and because when you beat someone that way and dehumanize them, it does something to you. That's how people become concentration camp guards. That's how they become extermination camp guards. You know, they, they, you do, you cross certain lines and then it becomes just regular. Once you go into that evil plane and you're just, you're just living out evil, you, you don't hardly even realize it. I mean, you realize it, but you, but it does things to you. You become part of it. It's, 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 it's dark. All right, the sacrifice of the wicked. The heart of the foolish do it not so. Well, you know, because sometimes, well, sometimes knowledge, uh, where I should say, and this is what it's really saying, is sometimes knowledge needs to come out. You need to, when you know something, you got to speak up. That's a speak up uh, proverb. The heart of the foolish keeps secret the knowledge when it ought to be spoken. You know, and it, and it could even hurt them. It could hurt others. There's times when you have to speak what you know. There's other times, you know, there's a time when there's silence. When the fool just dumps, you know, he says all of his, pours out all his foolishness. But the tongue of the wise use knowledge are right. The knowledge comes out and we use it correctly. But the fools, it just pours out foolishness. Whatever he seems to know, is there's no benefit to it. It all comes out wrong. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. You know, so the wicked, when, you know, it doesn't matter how much of a sacrifice they make, you notice. God is not just like light wanting sacrifices. And this is something that goes, I was thinking, I was meditating on Abraham and, uh, and Isaac and that whole thing with the sacrifice of Isaac. And I really think that when I th think about like what God had seen in the world when he called Abraham, there was, when he called Abraham, there was child sacrifice in the world. 
that's what people do, you know? People notice that, you know, hey, you know, if we if we make sacrifices, metaphorical sacrifices, like put things off to let, you know, we, we can get ahead. So, and in, in, in sometimes, you know, when we, like, let's say, to get out of a situation, they, they, we can't take the baby and they have to sacrifice the child or something like that. Like meaning not in a ritualistic way, but in a inevitability of a horrible situation type way. Okay. And people think that that may have a, whereby people arose to start sacrificing people as a way of appeasing gods right whoever they thought god was and so when god reveals himself to abraham he tests his face in this way will you sacrifice your child just like everybody else and he will but god stops him i don't think that god ever wanted to sacrifice but like are you as dedicated to me as the heathen are to their gods i don't know is that the question because it was common you know there are altars Ancient altars with filled with the bones of infants. All right. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. See, in the book of Isaiah, the prophet, and in other places, of course, you know, God indicates through his prophet that he doesn't want sacrifices, he wants people to do right. The sacrificial system as a way of appeasing God for our sins was because they have sins. So what, what do we do? Just walk away from them? But God's like, okay, you have to do something about it. There's got to be a cost. I mean, if you sin, there has to be some sort of cost, some price to pay, so you do this. But the idea was don't sin. <laughs> you know, and, Like they don't put um, a fine on not wearing a seatbelt because they want to collect revenue so much as that they want you to not, they want you to buckle in. Now, you know, again, you could argue the point on that one, right? That maybe it is about revenue, but not really. I mean, I don't know if they really get that many um, things on it because the cars are so annoying these days. My car makes the most horrible noise if I forget to put the seatbelt on. And it's so, her it, it makes me resentful. So much so, <laughs> I guess the machine, I know it's ridiculous. Well, it makes me feel this sort of like, Arr. and um, I know it's foolish. But uh, it started malfunctioning, and I was like, oh, and, I, and I'm just this type of person that, like, when it's not working, I'm much more likely, if I notice it isn't working, which I notice right away, put my seatbelt right back, right on, because uh, I'm g gladly, so I used to, I wore it before it was uh, made legal, or made uh, illegal not to, whatever, uh, but anyways, um. God wants us to obey for our, our own good. And because it doesn't, he doesn't want to be offended in our activities. You know, he does not want, there's no like God wants your sacrifices. God needs your sacrifices or God needs your worship. It's something you need to do because you have sin. Because you are on earth and God, and God is God. You need to worship God because why? Why do children need to listen to their parents? What are you talking about? Why does man need to worship God? Not because God demands it. I promise you that. That's not why. It's because he is so much, because he's our creator. <laughs> you know, that's what happens when you are created in the image of God and you see God. You worship. All will worship. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. To the glory of God the Father, you betcha. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. He doesn't want the sacrifice of the wicked. Now, of course, again, we are all sinners, right? So it's um, he's like, well, that's me. It's like, well, when it's like when he talks about the righteous. He's like the absolute righteous and the absolute wicked. Very few of us are the worst people in the world, but none of us is righteous. No, not one, right? But the point is we can be more or less wicked and our sacrifices can represent an exceedingly wicked heart. 
Because if we're just going out, you know, it's like in the Middle Ages when they when the Catholic Church was granting indulgences, something now that they even don't acknowledge was not something they should have done. I think I think they acknowledge that it's like, or, well, they don't do it anymore, right? You can't buy forgiveness of sins. You can't buy time off in purgatory, <coughs> <coughs> or maybe you can. I don't know. Maybe you can still buy some of those things. I mean, you know, how else are you going to get people to make big donations so you can build big churches if you don't give them some sort of some sort of uh, motivation? <laughs> but so notice that the wicked can make as much sacrifice as they like, but the, with the righteous, God is satisfied with their prayers. He does not need sacrifices from the righteous. He just delights in their prayers and their ta- and their petitions to Him. They just they want. Oh, you want something? They're asking of God. That's what a prayer is. The word means. Let's look up the exact one here, because I, you know, I pray, I beg. It almost, it, you know, is the idea. Where is it? Where are we? Oh, forty minutes. Okay. The prayer of the upright. Here we come. There we go. Well, that's why I like to have that lower because it keeps the ad off the screen. You can go there and see the ad yourself. Holiday lighting outlet. All right, Palal. Definition prayer, but how so? How so? Looks like pretty straightforward. Notice that when you see a nice, neat Brown Driver Briggs, uh, you know it's, it's pretty straightforward. Wow. Intercession, supplication by implication of him from Palau. What does it really mean? To intervene, interpose. Okay. So it's not like, be- there's one, I think, in the New Testament that means more like to plead, which I like. But it, but in, to interpose, to intervene, you know, to get into his business. You know, we're not offering God anything. We're, we're asking. We're talking to him for some reason petitioning him intervening interposing whatever or that was the second one but praying to him is not just like praising him it's not the praise of the righteous it's their prayers you know and that's that's the love of our god he's not demanding like that he he demands righteousness of course and we have it through christ that's why that's why it's you know the imputed righteousness of christ is so important because it means that God hears our prayers because he hears not sinners, you know, <clears throat> you know, that's why, you know, that's why when Christ was healing, that's what they were saying. We, we know this man because he has to be righteous because the, God doesn't listen to people. He's going to heal in the name of the wicked. Hmm. All right. Back here. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves him that follows after righteousness. You know, God, you know, follows after, notice I like that terminology because him that follows after righteousness, are you a follower of righteousness? Are you a, you know what I mean? Is that something you can say? I'm a fan of, right? I'm a, I'm a righteousness fanatic, you know? That's why I never liked saying I'm a fan of anybody because it's short for fanatic. But I'll say I'm a fan of righteousness. I'm a fan of God. But um, and all of a sudden, it's like, well, that's kind of weird, man. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a football fan. There we go. Now now that's normal. No, and I, and I always, I, the funny thing is, like, I am pretty uh, not interested in, in professional sports. And I do think sometimes that people do go a bit far. But, you know, whatever. I, I'm, you know, I'm not here to judge anybody. You know, I have my own things I probably, you know, things I like to do that have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. You know, like I said, there's all kinds of things in the world that are are perfectly acceptable and wholesome that are not evil or wicked. Unless, of course, it's uh, interposing between you and God in some ways. If if you're so into some sort of hobby or whatever that it's like, you know, that you, you don't find time for prayer, you don't find time to get into the word a little bit or something like that, you know, you're not, or it's leading you astray into sin. 
especially if it's leading us straight into sin. You know, anything that leads us to sin is definitely not something we need in our life. We need to follow after righteousness. You know, that's why I talk about, you know, sin means to miss the mark, and following after righteousness is what you're supposed to be doing. And, of course, the way of the wicked is to not follow after righteousness, obviously. It's something that God abominates. Yes, the sacrifice of the wicked and the way of the wicked. Correction is grievous unto the him that forsaketh the way. And he that hateth reproof shall die. That's, you know, the doubling up there. There's not a, sometimes there's some opposite Proverbs. I like these double up ones, like the eyes of the Lord are everywhere watching the good and the evil. <coughs> but, uh... And this one, all these, all these right here, I was like, oh, these are, these are, I like these proverbs because they're the kind that just sit there. They don't, they're not comparing, you know, the fool and the righteous. It's like hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? Yes. So what's that mean? Well, cor- first of all, correction is grievous to him that forsaketh the way. Yeah, when you're already on, when you're on the way out and you've made up your mind, I'm forsaking the way, and someone's telling you, it's like, oh, don't you know? You don't like to be stopped. I get it. Every time you sin, you know I mean, if if you've made up your mind to sin, and then someone comes along and says, "Hey, uh, uh, maybe you should," you know, it's like, Arr! "Don't stop me." But if you hate reproof like that, the end is death. If we don't, if we don't listen to reproof, if we do not, if we hate it, if we don't, if we don't say to it, "My brother." You know, thank you. Thank you. So hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? I wonder what destruction is. Oh, is that a poly uh, or whatever? The destruction? Uh, hold on a second. Bring it up. Hold on, bring it to you. Let us see. Hell and destruction. Destruction. Abaddon. Abaddon. Hell is Sheol. Sheol and Abaddon are before the Lord. <clears throat> Those are the two fallen angels. I'm just kidding. Well, it, it, you almost... Uh, Sheol and Abaddon. What if those were the proper names of fallen angels? That'd be kind of a... I'm not... I'm not <laughs> it'd be an interesting... Um, Addition to the scriptures there, right? Right, the king, the angel of the bottomless pit is called Abaddon. His name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. That's why I refer to a fallen angel. I'm not entirely kidding. <coughs> you see on the right hand here the mention also in Job. Just Abaddon and death. Destruction and death say. That consumeth to destruction, Abaddon. You know what I think Abaddon... Maybe it's an early... Well, it means destruction, right? A destruction or ruin. I think it is the original name of Gehenna or a, or a root concept of Gehenna that Jesus talked about, the Valley of Gehenna, the fire that burns to, de, to ultimate destruction. Because hell, properly understood, Sheol refers to the grave. And... uh. You can actually, well, actually, we'll look at that real quick. This is Sheol, definition underworld, or place to which people descend at death, of uncertain derivation, underworld, place to which people descend at death, that's what they say. But, well, where do you descend when you're death? Usually into the grave. You know, that, that's literally where you go down, into there. That's where are they? They're down there, you know, and that's the way they looked at it. That's why a lot of people think that the Hebrews didn't believe in the afterlife because the concept of Sheol as the underworld is really not developed beyond the idea of a pit. I mean, it literally is just a pit. And that's why in the New Testament, I think we have the concept of uh, the things coming out of the bottomless pit, the pit of the abyss and things like that. Um, but, I, but if you look on the right hand side here. All the, again, also it's a linguistic thing. It's like whatever the Hebrews used it for, just like the the uh, Greeks, is not so significant as 
what it the scripture reveals it to ultimately be. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like if it's their word for the underworld, like Hades, it doesn't mean we should apply all the mythology of Hades immediately to Sheol. I said, I think one of the reasons that um, it has been argued that the ancient Hebrews didn't believe in an afterlife is because of Sheol. They didn't believe in an afterlife. They believed in a resurrection, as I've talked about, that there is hope in death, as it is revealed later in the prophets, like Isaiah, my dead body shall arise. That was a hope. And we see that hope realized in Christ who rose from the dead and sits at the right hand of God. So that is that. Resurrection is the way we enter into everlasting life. And this idea of another intermediate stage, I think is just a fanciful mythology that people believe in, and I even see echoes of it in the scripture, but I don't actually think it's taught by the scripture. Um, and one has to, you know, take like the parable of Lazarus and just say, well, okay, that's literal. Because that, that is basically your, if you remove that, if you say that's a parable and we're not going to consider that as being actually doctrinal information about the afterlife, if you remove that, there's really nothing. Uh Nothing left to support. There's a few, a couple of verses. I don't believe in, and people say, do you believe in soul sleep? No, I believe it's like, it's like, uh, think of it as time travel. The moment you die, the next moment you're risen from the dead. You know? You won't even notice. That's why I think it's really cool is you're going to die. Next thing you know, it's the judgment. We're gonna, next thing we know, we're going to see Jesus. <laughs> It's weird to think that everyone who's died is, is going to be, because this is what I believe, that everyone who has died is actually about to experience the exact same moment as everyone else. <laughs> is the, They're all going to be, like, they all died, and they're all coming back at the same moment. Now, of course, that's the righteous dead in the resurrection at the return of Christ, the first resurrection, I should say. And the, the, the second resurrection, which is not called the second resurrection, but which we will say... We could call the final resurrection, for sure. Uh, for sure? I don't know. I, we couldn't, actually. Not for sure. Because what if the Lord did other things and there were more resurrections of other things? So I don't know. I tend not to think so, but we'll call it the next resurrection. <laughs> the one that is not the first, but the one after, where the white throne is. At that resurrection, uh, I suppose we will all... The, the, it's the same thing, same moment. When you die, I believe... The next thing you know is the resurrection. And there's no like waiting period or, uh, you know, watching and waiting. You know, everyone's up in heaven waiting for the end and watching what's going on. It's, no, 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 no. I don't think so. Not literally anyways. And I'm, I'm interested in the literal part of it and in the spiritual part of it. Of course, the spiritual part of it is a great insight. Hell and destruction. So hell is Sheol, and destruction I think of as destruction. I mean, that, that, that thing, the angel of the bottomless pit is called Abaddon, destruction. You know, was it depart ye cursed unto the fire prepared for the devil and his angels? The devil is that angel of destruction, in my opinion. I mean, you know, I suppose you could assign, well, there's another one. There's an Abaddon, and there's a this Don, and that guy, and... But whatever, you know, some people get into that, like I said, get into the angelology and all that stuff. And uh, I'm not, you know, to me that's that's not worshiping angels, but it may be intruding into things which we have not seen, which I also try to avoid, especially when it comes to stuff that is just, you know, uh, speculative. I mean, it's fun to talk about it, but I mean, as far as you won't hear me be dogmatic about it, that's for sure. You know, maybe we should, maybe, you know, like I was thinking about it, maybe when I go, after I get done going through everything and going back to a couple books I really want to do over, um, after I do those books over, maybe at some point I'll do a couple of the apocryphal books or something, I don't know. It'd be fun. <coughs> Interesting. So, um, the concept, the grave... And that which is beyond the grave, the destruction that is even greater than that. 
Because in the grave, the righteous have hope. But in destruction, there is really no, that is the place of the ultimate, in my opinion, where there is no more hope. Like where Satan dwells. You know, the angels reserved to destruction. You know, and and that is the, you know, in the Bible, there's a lot of th- passages where, you know, fear not them that destroy your body, that, can, that kill your body but can't destroy your soul. Fear rather him that can. Uh, destroy both soul and body in hell, in Gehenna is what it says. He can destroy them there. Now people say, like, well, destroy, you know, that they'd rather take a more figurative destruction because we don't want you destroyed, boy. We want you alive and kicking so you can feel that pain for all eternity. I take a little more, I take the death quite literally and I take the torment actually is more of the figurative part because that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> uh, and because also it's literally a coin toss if you, if you think about it. And there's a lot more scriptures that say people are getting destroyed than the ones that are saying they're going to get tormented. Let me tell you that. So the question is, which one modifies the other? Which one is symbolic? Which one is figurative, spiritual, or whatever you want to say? And which one is not? And if you do, you don't realize that you, it is a choice people make. It, maybe the choice is made for you by your church, but the choice is made. It's a deliberate choice. As far as, you know, I mean, a lot of people, like I said, they're not actively choosing, but the point is, that you you actually do have the choice there. It's like I, when they tell me, "Oh yeah, death." That that's just spiritual. It's like you could just wave your hand like that and say that. Says who? Oh, I get to wave my hand and say that too. That's awesome. I like that trick. Torment is spiritual. Death is literal. Yeah. <laughs> Destruction is literal. No, you're not metaphorically destroyed. You're literally destroyed. We're we're the 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 you know. And all you suffered and all that, metaphorically, we're going to keep that and use that, and that's going to go on. You know, all we extracted from your existence is still going to be some use out of it, yeah. But, I mean, we're not. it's not going to be, like, literal torture. People are tortured to get information. You know, we got to know where the bomb is. We got to know where the wickedness and prove and this and that and the other. After that... No reason to keep a bitter, resent, resentful soul cursing God for all eternity. I mean, what, what's the point of that? Lights out. You know, see, I can, I can actually get into God's justice and see the righteousness of it. And I never hear that from people who love uh, to say the, the more traditional, I don't, I don't want to call it, tra- it's traditional, it's more traditional, I suppose. But even my view is also traditional. It's a tradition that goes back to the to the beginning with everybody else. So I mean, it's like, I mean, everyone claims apostolic. <laughs> you know, uh, oh yeah, sure. You know, we we go back to the apostles. Everybody does my doctrine because it, you argue basically. Well, it's the scriptures, and a lot of things were not seen as priorities. That's where we often get off, right? Like explaining the, the exact nature of things, I guess. Well, I don't know. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. God is judge of the world. Right? Hell and destruction are at his at his call. You know, they're at his command. Bring you down to the grave and destroy you forever. Bind you in the pit that has no bottom, in the blackness that has no light. You know what I mean? Because to God, because like I said, there's nothing more. I think to God, there's nothing more awful than not being. I mean, not being, not being. No, having been and then not being. Whoa, you know? Because he is. He raised. He lives forever. And has been and always will be. It's like, you know, well, I, I, I do think we could think of worse things. I mean, <laughs> but I think that's pretty bad. That's bad enough. You know what I mean, it's bad enough to descend into blackness forever. 
which is ultimate destruction. You know, like I like take all the scriptures. I mean, you may what I think about them may be slightly different than you, but I mean, I agree with everything. They shall be tormented forever and ever, metaphorically. <laughs> a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. Oh wait, I skipped there. Okay, yeah. Oh, how much more? So you know, if those things, go, God has these powers at His command. And so, what in your heart? You know, the hearts of the children of men. You know, these great, ma these, because the idea of death and hell, because that's what you could say, uh, that's almost the way you look at it. hell and destruction, whatever. These concepts of, of um, these things that humanity encounters, these are like huge, like death. It's a big deal. Like, it happens to all of us. It's part of every one of our lives. And God, and bef and God like, to them, to him, he, he just has them in the palm of his hand. He can dispense with hell. And so your heart is there. You know? He can save you from hell. He can save you from the grave. I mean, that's why I say it. to me it's very hopeful in a sense of like hey he has power over hell power over destruction we see it in that death had no hold on him death could not hold him the Lord Jesus rose from the dead right we saw death bow before him it could not hold him so we know when he, when he promises that our faith results in salvation and delivery from death and destruction, from hell and etc., you can count on that. You know, and we are in his hand. You know, that's why I would say salvation, trust the Lord because salvation is his work and he is good at it. That's why I don't, I don't believe in losing your salvation people who lose their salvation never really had it that's what you know they they, they all they yammered they were with us they went out from us because they were not of us i always insist on that because because it's like god isn't fooled oh yeah i was a sincere believer they lie they lie they're liars they are li i i don't believe in one of them you know i don't I don't, I don't, because I, it's like, you know, you know, what, 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 you know, it's like, oh, you know, you find out what denominate. Oh, yeah, we were Mormons. It's like, oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. You, you knew Christ. I don't believe you. Anyways, so there we are. We'll pick it up uh, next week at verse 16. Is that where we're at here? Oh, no, verse uh, 12. Okay, a scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will go to the wise. That's fine enough. All right, thanks for joining me. We'll be back again next week. Until then, remember the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All right, here we go. Hmm. Oh. Right. And with their lips to honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among these people, even a marvelous work in a wonder. For the wisdom of the wise shall perish, and the understanding of the brute shall be hid. Woe to them that seek deep to hide their counsel from Yahweh, and their works are in the dark, and they say, who sees us and who knows us? Surely you're turning a thing upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the works of him that made it, he made it.